I, I, I don't know. I, I come to the ghost of dark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the word got around that people with, with different ones was carving. Uh, I, I used to visit Cigar. With, with, oh, it was a bunch of us. They used to hang out cigars like they did here. Mm -hmm. and just go up there and he'd be sitting there carving and cussing and going into that mess. <laughs> and I guess maybe it's some of that rubbed off on me. I don't know. <laughs> He's only about two years older than I am. And that was in what, like the 1960s? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Real early, maybe 1960 or something like that. And who all would go and hang out with you there? George, all of them passed away, every one of them. George, George Clark, some of the Clark boys, and John, and uh, Clarence, you know Clarence Stein? Mm -hmm. Well, his brothers. He lived next door to Cigar. Okay. When they lived down on Pawnee Island, mm -hmm. down on this end. And they'd all get hang out there and cigar spending big yarns. <laughs> no. I'm sure none of you all did the same. Yeah, everybody did the same. Uh -huh. So maybe some of it rubbed off. <laughs> we had a car. Well, my father had a little shop. And I went in there and made some things with him. And uh, he didn't give a damn. How, what they looked like, or how how good they were, and just how many he could make. And I was just the opposite. I wanted to do better than that. So we fell to it. Mm -hmm. Not long before I, I, I moved out of his shop, in my own shop. Shortly after I left high school, yeah. Uh, the first waterfowl related thing I remember. I was just a, a toddler, or you know, five or six, um, and Dad would bring all of the stuff that he had killed into the garage and lay them out before he would clean them. Hmm. Well, I would sit there and look at the, the birds, you know, I would look at the, the way the feathers went together and the coloration and all that kind of stuff, and actually my first word was duck. Believe it or not, <laughs> we had a, a, a stream or a creek that ran in the back of the house, and Dad would put corn out there just to attract the ducks. And when I was a baby, that was what Mom would point out. She would take me to the window and point out duck, and mm -hmm. duck was my first word. So I've been doomed ever since. You know, just, <laughs> uh, just wanted something better. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. we made the decoys, shot them out by hatchet, mm -hmm. uh, melted the lid, put the keels on them, and she can take guys. Winder decoys different than mainland people. How do they do that? Uh, let's see. You see how that's winding yep. around his neck and his tail? Sort of an X pattern yeah. around. Uh -huh. The ones on the mainland wrap around the uh, back of their neck. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we would make the uh, lid. When I got started, and it, uh, Roe used to come over my house quite a bit, and uh, he, he still talks about that. We, had, we used to have a good time. Yeah. Yeah. And who'd you learn from? Or did you just me? You learned by doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I was always like to do something different. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes it turns out good, sometimes it didn't. Mm -hmm. When I first made them, they were crude, mm -hmm. <laughs> real crude, <laughs> but it worked. Hunting. I done, right yeah, I done. I, I made them for the hunt with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When the plastic decoys come out, I turned right over and bought plastic ones. Mm -hmm. But I decided that I. Got so I could, the hunters would buy one, buy a decoy from me that they made once in a while. And I said, Doggone, I believe I can might be able to make two or three dollars on it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I started carving mostly ducks to begin with, and then I started birds, shorebirds, which I like better now than do, like I do ducks. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's how it started. I mean, I'm not like a bunch of them say, well, I went up and sat with Mr. Miles. I knew Mr. Miles real well, but mm -hmm. I never went up and sat and watched him carve. Oh, you didn't? Huh. Mm -hmm. Oh, you selling terrapins. Oh, you did? Yeah. yeah. When we started hunting, shinky tickers would kill more than what the limit. Yeah. And we never wasted anything. We had aunts, uncles, cousins, mm -hmm. father, mother. See, my dad got me a gun when I was 13. Bad mistake, <laughs> big bad mistake, but I, I loved it, you know. And uh, we started killing, and we, we would 
feed a lot of people, and, and mm -hmm. to this day we still do some of that. We feed a lot of people uh, if we're fishing or if we're hunting, mm -hmm. you know, especially, especially the, the widows, you know, we would give to them. And uh, the game boards didn't like that. <laughs> so we devised ways to act smart the game board. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. how it worked. Yep. And uh, we, we have a lot of tails. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it, wow. it worked good. Yep. Five or six years old, they got me a BB gun when I was when I was six. That's and real I sweet. Killed my first duck at seven. Nice. It was a Brant. It was out of season. Mm -hmm. That was my first. <laughs> I guess that was my first downfall of the law. <laughs> uh, down on South Main Street at the time, all the Brant, huge flocks of Brant, uh, would come up by the edge of the road mm -hmm. all winter long. I mean, January, February, March, these hundreds and hundreds of Brant would yeah. get by the road and. Mom and Dad gave me this gun. It was, it was a daisy pump, and it was uh, too big for me to cock, so I'd get Doug to cock mm -hmm. it for me. I'd run across the street, and I'd shoot into these brant, and I'd run back, and he'd cock mm -hmm. it for me again. And I'd come running in. I was seven years old. I said, I killed me a duck. <laughs> he said, no, you didn't. I said, yeah, I did. I killed me a duck. Mom said, Doug, look out that window. And then there was this brant floating upside down. I shot into him, shot my right side of the head. Killed him graveyard dead. Doug ran out, got him, cleaned him for me, and we ate him. Nice. And that was out of season. I had no license. <laughs> Shooting from the road over a highway. <laughs> I broke every law I could think of when I was seven years old. It's a good and, start. <laughs> and I thought, this is a good start. <laughs> and uh, I kept right on going. <laughs> I don't think I would know how to. Just got to pick it, pick the fuckers off and him, and clean him up and put him in the. Uh, Lola, you. She always put them in the oven, like you bake a chicken or mm -hmm. in the roaster and cook it till it got done. Mm -hmm. Would you cook the whole bird or would the you breast bird, it? whole bird. Just okay. clean him out good and cook the whole bird. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of work, getting all the feathers off and doing all it's, that. It is for some people, but I, I don't more mind it nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is your favorite kind to eat? Uh. Corn fed black duck used to be like the best, mallard. Ten tails was good duck. Mm -hmm. But I, I eat all kinds of everything when, when we're growing up. We eat whatever, whatever daddy brought home when I was growing up, we eat. Did you eat shorebirds then too? Yeah. I paid two fines in my whole entire life, all the hunting and everything I've ever done. And the first fine was shooting for short, shooting shorebirds. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, a, I was only about, about 15. Huh. And I, I was dying to, uh, in Hog Island Bay, board of a dying bay boat. Mm -hmm. My uncle was the captain then, and I was crazy. All I wanted to do was kill something, get out in the marsh and shoot when I wasn't working. Mm -hmm. So I shot. I went and shot this little uh, bunch of shorebirds. I mean, it must have been about like 50 or 60. <laughs> All kinds of yellow legs and everything. And we uh, cl cleaned part of them and put them in the pot and started cooking them before we went out to work so we could have them all ready when we come in for the heat. Mm -hmm. And the game board would come by and saw some of the skins and, and stuff from the birds laying along the bank. They went board the boat and searched the boat oh. and find them. <laughs> Hell, they were waiting to the boat when we uh -huh. waiting, waiting in the boat when we come aboard that day. Nobody wasn't going to own up to it, so they said. He said, "Well, it was three of them." He said, "Well, what what, all, what we're going to do if somebody don't take the blame? We're going to take the whole crew ashore." So. <laughs> so you took the blame. I had to take the blame. But anyway, I was poor. I was poor. I was scared to death. Yeah. I got 170 right there. You want to get a picture of those sometime? And yeah. uh, that's the ones I hunt over. Uh, I love shooting over the real thing. I like how the, the to watch the reaction of the birds when mm -hmm. they land. Each on a Sunday, and I seen these ducks in these traps. These traps were full of ducks. Uh, John Buckaloo was the game warden and the refuge manager, and he had traps full of ducks. <laughs> So I said, when it gets dark, I'm going to relieve him of some of them. He's got too many. So I fired him up. One for the government, one for Seagull. Mm -hmm. So I tell him I fired him up, all of them up. Mm -hmm. And about a hundred, I guess, all together. 
took about a hundred. That's all I could carry. I had to chain tote them, tote them all the time down, you go back and get them. Back and get them. That was how I got the name Segar. He found it. Uh, in the meantime, I, I, I was in that trap, running them ducks down, and some cigars jumped out of my pocket. I had a sweatshirt on and a, a, jag, a, a coat pocket, and he got out of my pocket in the trap. He found them next morning. He wanted to know who smoked cigars. Figured he could who, who smoked them cigars, he got his ducks, you know. Well, he figured it out after a while. But there wasn't nothing he could do about it. They've been calling me the duck man since the old CB days, Citizen Band Radio, <laughs> and everybody had a handle. And uh, when the carvers here on the island died, they called him the duck man. And after he passed away, I took it. You took it? Nice. <laughs> Well, I think my interest started when I would pick up his dead birds and look at the anatomy and look at the coloration and that kind of stuff. Um, and he had a lot of old decoys, you know, a lot of Ira Hudson's and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And I would pick them up and look at them. And um, Right about the time I was getting to the age where I could actually pick up a knife or pick up a paintbrush, um, we moved from up there to down here. And luckily for me, that's right about when it started to be a lot of carvers on the island. So I was able to ride my bicycle over to Tommy Savage's, and mm -hmm. he'd be sitting there whittling, and I would be talking, and, and you know, eventually I would, I would start buying decoys from him. I bought a lot of decoys because we used to have a, a gift shop at the motel, and I would sell his decoys oh. in the motel. Mm -hmm. um, no, I never carved with Tommy. I would sit there and talk and, and shoot the breeze and buy birds, um, resell them and that kind of stuff. Um, and then Reggie Birch came along one day to talk to Tommy about something. And I picked up on Reggie. And I was like, man, I really like what he does. You know, I said, Reggie, would you mind if I came over one day? Sat down and talked. He said, sure, come on over. And while I was at Reggie's, you know, he was like, why don't you carve? Mm -hmm. I don't know. So he started, he cut, cut a bird out for me, and he carved one side of it and gave me a knife and says, okay, you see if you can match up what I've done. And that's the way it started. He carved half of it, I carved half of it. Um, and he taught me the basics of using a hatchet and a spoke shave and all that kind of stuff. And I carved with him for a number of years, you know, right in his shop using his bandsaw and his chopping block. And, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, he he's responsible for teaching me a lot, a lot of stuff. It's fun. So, um, yeah, you know, I'd, the first set of decoys I made uh, was with a friend of mine, and we were hunting what we call up the bay, and I sold them right out of the water. Uh, one of the guides had a couple so-called sports, were in the boat, and saw my little buffalo head sitting there, and said, "Oh, who made those little little guys? Would you consider selling a couple?" Of them? I sold a couple of them, and realized, "Oh." You know, not only can I use them for hunting, you know, I can make, I can make a little bit of money. How old were you then when well, you let's see. that happened? Oh, I was in my 20s at that point. I started carving in 1977. But all along, you know, I'd hunted since I was 13 or 14 years old. Hmm. Okay. So I used plastic decoys and rubber decoys and carry lights and victors. But the first inclination of making something wooden uh, came with the need of not being able to buy the certain species that we wanted to hunt with that coming season. Do so, you remember what species that was? They were actually just little buffalo heads and hooded mergansers. You could not buy those. Uh, they were, at that point, they weren't making them. Or we didn't know where to buy them because we were just buying local decoys here from Parks Market. We was working, working decoys. Started working, then went to miniatures because I couldn't find enough wood to make mm -hmm. Yeah, And I made miniatures for a little while, not, not too long because... I realized that I, did, I wasn't going to be a world champion and I couldn't, the decorative, because you wanted to make them fancy, and I was more into using hand tools and not power mm -hmm. tools. And I needed little power tools and such to make miniatures that would sell. So I went back to working decoys and started competing. 
That way I could start selling my working decoys at shows. They weren't really used. I haven't made maybe 200 decoys that have ever been actually used hmm. over my career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm known for you know, decoys, working decoys, mm -hmm. rough ones. Yeah. Um, and every time I would have like a, a rough spot, I would go ask somebody for advice, like the brand that I carved. Um, I didn't know how to paint the sides on it, so I went to Cigar, because Cigar, you know, was the man. He was, when I first started carving, he was the the best on the island. Um, so he was he was the, the man to go see when you had trouble, and I, would, I went up to Sig, and I said, all right, Sig, I'm having trouble doing this. I painted it about five times. Tell me what to do. And he said, oh, you just mix this and mix this, and, and he painted it <laughs> while I was sitting there. I was like, no, Sig, I don't want you to paint it. Tell me. He said, well, you can wipe it off if you want to. I was like, uh-uh. No way. So no. I've got a brand that I carved and Sig painted sitting in my house. And that's why. Because I love doing it. Um, you know, I, I, you can't, you can buy plastic buffle heads, but they're, they don't have the movement that your natural birds do. They don't float as well as, as birds made out of wood. Um, plus, it gives you a, a, a sense that you've accomplished something. When something you got out floating in the water can actually fool Mother Nature to come in and sit with something that you've made, you've accomplished something. Mm -hmm. Going out and buying a piece of plastic is not the same deal. I learned, but, uh, I learned that uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to carve ducks, mm -hmm. I wanted to eat them, I wanted to kill them, shoot them, carve them. And when I got 15 years old, I was watching Doug. And uh, he said, you can do it. I took his chopping block and hatchet, started chopping and carving, and I've got one of them in the house today, the first thing I ever made, 15 years old. Oh, nice. Yeah, and I kept right on making them through the Navy days, my four years in the Navy. And now, roughly 10,000 pieces later, uh, it's, been a, it's been a good life, a real, real good life. Yep. Mm -hmm. Growing up on South Main Street, all the clams and fish you wanted, None of these motels, no McDonald's. Days, what kind of birds? Probably the hooded merganser. Hmm. Uh, the hairhead, we call them. Yeah. Uh, I love making them. Uh, I'm fascinated by them. I've got a place where I shoot a lot of them. And I can put them out in the pond and, and watch them land and see how they reaction. And they, there's, they can put their head in a hundred different positions. Mm -hmm. God, it's unbelievable what they can do with that little bit of crest. Yeah. The hens and the drakes. So I've got. 14 of them over there. I'm trying to make a, I'm trying to make one of every head style. They're on that right hand side over that filing cabinet. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll get a picture of those. Yep. And they're really, they're really, they're really fun to shoot and hunt. And, and they're pretty little bird. And they sell great. 20 ducks a week. And this is how I, I bandsaw them out. Get a rough shape on them. And I sit here, and that's how I take the wood off all day long. Duh. And it's just it just progressed. We Shinkatig, um has a a tradition of helping, um, and one of the ways that you pass on decoy carving is by helping others learn. Hmm. And one of the big things I think about Shinkatig is that. Any shop you go to, they'll teach you how to carve. Mm -hmm. You know, if you sit there long enough and talk to them, and they'll teach you how to carve. Um, you know, you don't have to pay anybody. You don't have to. All you're doing is passing time with them, and they'll yeah. teach you how to carve. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of people who, you know, they've carved a few, just just for their, you know, just to see if they could do it. They'll carve a few. They'll go to somebody's shop and they'll show them this, that, and the other. And they'll carve a few, and then they won't do it anymore. But you know, it, it's just that way of passing things on. And I think Shinkatig is big in that aspect of helping others pass on that tradition of waterfowling and duck carving. And, um, and that's that's how I got into it, you know. Mm, camera. Yeah. Camera stuff. Back on uh, the, the, the kids nowadays that want to be carvers, I mean, I knew I was artistic. Uh, I, I wanted to be a cigar daisy. I used mm. to go over to cigs all the time. And my buddy would take me over, he'd have bushel baskets of heads and bushel baskets of bodies. And I'd look at him and I thought, you know, he can put them in the water, a duck flies by, think it's a real thing, comes out to it, and you kill him. And, and I wanted, I liked hunting, mm -hmm. and I knew that 
I can make a decoy. And uh, I made this bird, and it was the best thing I thought I'd ever made. Of course, it was only only made about six of them. I was 15, and I took it to Captain Sig, and I said, uh, I said, what do you think of it? He says, well, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. He gave it back to me. I was 15 years old. I said, do what? He said, well, you're trying to make a nice bird, a nice detailed bird. I said, yes, sir. He said, what'd you use for wood? I said, cottonwood. Yeah. He said, can't do that. He said, you got to have better wood. Mm -hmm. So the sow's ear was the cottonwood. Mm -hmm. Now, I was trying to make a silk purse out of it. You can't do it. you got to have better wood. Now, you know what Sig was using? Cottonwood. That's all he was using. <laughs> but he knew some things about it that I did. About being green, about being dry, about hollowing it out, sealing it. Uh, there was a lot of things that I didn't... Sig would always say, I'll tell you anything you want to know. Well, you had to ask the question. If you didn't yeah. know how to ask the question, then, you know, the old saying is, I taught him everything he knows, mm -hmm. but I didn't teach him everything I know. Mm -hmm. So he's only telling you, what you asked him. Yeah. And then he'd kind of laugh and you come back and he'd say, why'd you do that? He said, oh, I said, well, I, th I thought you said, he said, no, 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 I didn't say that. You <laughs> said, can I do this? I said, sure, you can do it. You went home and did it and it was wrong. <laughs> said, you son of a bitch. <laughs> you done it to me again. So he, he, but he, he could have been the best carver. I mean, he won best in the world for mm -hmm. working decoy. But he could have been better than anybody. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will doubt and they'll, they'll say they'll, they'll differ with me. They got to remember, Sig was doing it for a living. Lucy? In, in my way of thinking, carving was not really considered a big thing um, when, it, when it really got going. I mean, Shinkatig itself was always a waterfowling destination. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, we, we went from using live decoys and then they were outlawed and then people started making their making decoys for use because of the, the live ones were outlawed. Mm -hmm. um, and we just had some, some local craftsmen that were very talented at it. Um, you know, we, because we were an island, we had a lot of boat builders. Um, boat building lends itself to decoy carving, you're, you're using the same type of woods, the same construction methods, what have you. Um, and it just naturally progressed from, you know, okay, you can um, build a boat, you can also make a decoy. Um, and then we had a couple of the decoy carvers that got very good at it. And a couple of the decoy carvers actually would make birds um, for their own use. And then we had a couple of people that made birds for everybody else to use. Um, and the Shinkatig style of bird was, was a little bit more crude than, than other places. We weren't as refined, but they were functional. Um, we, were, we used wood that was available. Um, you know, we, we weren't pigeonholed into one certain type of wood. You know, we, if a ship spur washed up or a light pole, they would take that and use that for carving. If they could make it to the mainland and get cottonwood, which is a local grown wood on the mainland, they would use cottonwood. Um, you know, they would use anything that washed up or what, whatever was available. Um, but it, 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 the, in the carving community, um, there were a lot of birds that were coming out of Shinkatig, so more and more people were coming to Shinkatig in order to get carvings, mm -hmm. get ducks. Um, and it, I think the, the name of Shinkatig just got to be in the carving community because so many birds were coming out of Shinkatig. Yeah, so, I mean? think it is a mystique, you know, because we are a, you know, a hunting community, a waterman, a fisherman community, and that's what we were piggybacking on, I think. Uh, it's the same as I was going to say about the oysters, you know. There, there's oysters coming from all over the country being brought here to be opened and canned here because of the Shingatig brand or the Shingatig name. And I think that's what's really happened with decoys as well because you know, we've had three really important carvers over the earlier part of the market hunting years. You know, and Ira Hudson and Doug Jester, Mom's Hancock, and of course a living legend here, Shing uh, Cigar Daisy of course. So we actually have four uh, in Corbin Reed. There's many, you know, 
if you look at the old maps of all the carvers around here, mm -hmm. and it was, they, they went through a renaissance as well. They were market hunters, and then when the ducks started disappearing, they started carving for the tourist industry. And they would have little, a little picnic table setting out in front of their house with their little carvings out, and tourists would stop in and buy them. So it's, it's the, yeah, I think Shingatig is an important part. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. people come, first time they, they meet me, you know, they look at my business, oh, Shingatig, I've been to Shingatig, of course I have. You know, uh, it's a remarkable how many people know Shingatig. It really is. I've even met people in Germany, you know, that have heard of, 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 of Shingatig. Hmm. Yeah. Yes, there there are. I mean, the, the Shingatig style is more of a working bird, mm -hmm. um, kind of kind of rough around the edges, but functional. Okay. Um, you know, there are certain certain characteristics of Shingatig style birds, like the, all the puddle ducks have their tails up higher than normal rather than than lower. Um, there's a few Shingatig style birds. Now these guys. You can, you can pick the eastern shore of Virginia because people bring the old decoys that's un, that you can't identify who made them, but immediately you can tell that they're made in the eastern shore. One of the few things from there for old decoys you can say from Shigatig is they're made of cottonwood. They call it cottonwood here. And it's actually royal polonia is what that tree is. It's, we, Kansas is full of cottonwood, but it's not the same cottonwood that we consider cottonwood. It's a tree that was brought here in colonial times, and actually the seeds were, it was the modern, or it was the antique style of peanuts, the old plastic peanuts that we put into our packaging material. That's how they shipped their belongings, China and such. And the seed pods was what they packed them in. And Williamsburg, full of these so-called cottonwood trees, they're royal polonia, what country they're from, I think they're European. Mm. And uh, if you see a decoy that's made of cottonwood, an old one, it's it's eastern shore for sure, and you usually can zoom in to Shingatig. Hmm. For some reason, Shingatig people really like to use that wood. Hmm. Mm. Why do you but think they, or some other style of bird? The way they made them, they made them uh, probably in, uh, three quarters of an inch in width, and maybe four four or five inches in length. Okay. And on the ends, they would flatten it a little bit so you could get the nail through it. Mm. He would put it, he would nail the, uh, the front part, put them in the water, if he leaned that way, he would shift the back until he even died. Oh, okay. And then he would pin the other. Huh. Yeah, a lot of that. And then they used uh, uh, flat uh, tel uh, television wire. It's a flat wire, maybe half inch, it's got little strands of copper in it, real mm -hmm. tough. They bend it over and drive it under, underneath of it in order to uh, uh, put the string. Uh, well, a lot of times I had made them with my umflip in the bottom though. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, I would, on the front of them, some of them I did, I made a, a tip sticking off like that, that when it hit the bottom, it would cock down quicker. Huh. And I would put the shanks probably three and a half inches long, mm -hmm. make them out of, uh, uh, if you could get copper, the hard copper, and you would, you would flange it, act like that, and you mm -hmm. said then your mold would pour over it, and it, it would really do it, would fall down and catch the edge, and the more it pulled, it dug into it. Hmm. Oh, interesting. I do most of the chopping uh, with the hatchet, then I get, get the body cut down and shaped up pretty good, and then I use that Fordham tool to take all the hatchet marks out. Mm -hmm. Use knife for the heads and stuff. Mm -hmm. And what do you use for the bills? Oak. Oak. Okay. I've got some pieces of oak, and I just cut them out on the bandsaw. Mm -hmm. And they're uh, kind of sunk in. I drill a hole and just sink, sink them in there, and they won't get broke off so quick. Mm -hmm. Hi, he was just he was something else. He was selling me his miniatures, these little miniatures. Mm -hmm. Kept them in the house. In the summertime, he had a towel over top the oil stove, and he'd have them on there, and they were three dollars a piece. Mm -hmm. And I was buying them. I was a decoy broker at the time. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I was buying them, but I was buying these little miniatures for three dollars a piece. And I bought them and bought them, and I went there one day. I said, uh, "This was after he had his leg cut off. He had to have his leg uh, amputated. I think diabetes." Oh, I didn't realize. 
So he's sitting there on the couch, and uh, I said, Mr. Miles, I want to get some more ministers. He said, well, there they are, son. Pick out what you want. He said, but I had to go up. He said, they're five dollars now. Hmm. I said, good Lord, five dollars? I said, I'll take one, but I can't afford no more. <laughs> and that was the last miniature I bought from him hmm. for five dollars. Hmm. He was selling me, he was selling me life-size decoys to hunt with for three dollars a piece. Wow. Um, at the time, I was 15, and I told Mom I wanted a, a dozen dippers and a dozen shell ducks hmm. to gun with from Mr. Miles. She said, how much are they? I said, they're $3 a piece. They're $36 a dozen. She said, well, if you want them, that's all you're going to get. You ain't getting nothing else. Mm -hmm. that, that, that kind of money. So she got them for me, and I got a picture, I'll show you in a little bit, of me opening them up under the Christmas tree. Aww. And she got me a dozen dippers, a dozen shell ducks, and I thought, just like right now, if you go to an auction and somebody consigns a Miles Hancock, Mm -hmm. It might have, it might be a Mason decoy body, mm -hmm. it might be a, a Doug Jester body. Miles would tell us, he said, you boys can't afford these high-priced ducks. He said, so he would put his head on anybody's body. Mm -hmm. And back then we gunned with all wooden birds. Yeah. You broke the heads off all the time. Threw them in the corner. Mm -hmm. Next summer you make a bunch of heads and, and we hit them. So Miles wasn't selling people fake birds. Right. In his mind, he made the body, he made the head, he painted them, mm -hmm. or he fitted the head on. But the body could be Sears and Robot, it could yep. be a, a Pratt or a Mason or anybody in the world. It could be Upper Bay body. Yeah. And and this picture I've got, when I thought were all original Miles Hancocks, half of them were machine-made bodies. <laughs> Masons and so on. <laughs> and he put his head on it, and it could have been a bluebill, a black duck, anything. <laughs> If you wanted dippers, they were going to be black and white. <laughs> painted them as a different. Yeah, it was painted. They were some of that big and some of that big. But they were different. And then you want shell ducks? He put a shell duck head. It could have been a canvas back, but now it's a shell duck. That's good. And he painted it like a shell duck. Well, that's probably. In Shinkatek speak, these are stools. They're not decoys. They're mm -hmm. stools. Um, oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. It's, now gunning stools? Does it have just to be just, just stools? Just okay. stools. They mm. don't. They don't yeah. have to be gunning stools. They're just stools. When you mention. Hey, can you go pick up my stools? They know what you're talking yeah. about. I'm going to pick up your decoys for you. Hmm. Um, let's see. Did you ask about oyster catchers? Before, Old you... squalls. Old squalls, not long-tailed ducks to be yes. politically correct. Um, they're called sow settlers. And yep. that came from the noise that they make. Um, we used to be able to go out at night and listen to them on the bay. It just carried, echoed all over the bay, these old squalls, sounding off that and it, it just carried throughout the bay if you had a real quiet night. Um, you agree for yeah. it? Okay, yeah. so a buffalo head. Dipper. A dipper. And a red-breasted merganser. Shelled up. Uh, is there a uh, hooded merganser? All right, head. It's <laughs> very good. And um, what other ones do I know? Um, what about a black duck? Black it's just black. <laughs> <laughs> that one makes too much sense. Uh, what about for a, a hair, a great blue heron? Cranky. Cranky. That's great. <laughs> that. You know, people used to eat a lot of them. Really? Oh yeah. Oh. I've had people come to me and say, "I need one for dinner." I get him one. Hmm. I've never eaten one myself. Hmm. But I believe he was real fishy. <laughs> I would think so. I would think so. What other? Um, is a pintail a springtail here? Springtail. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. What am I missing? You know. Ball pate. Ball. We call them uh, ball crowns. Ball pates. Ball pate or ball crown? If it's is it, the real name is a uh, ball crown, I believe it is, and we call them ball, ball pates. I think is that a widget? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Like what's a buffle head? Dipper. Uh, yeah, dippers <laughs> and and. Blue dipper. Uh, Hooded, hooded McGanders, we call them high heads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the red brush with shell, shell ducks. I never understood that one. Why are those called shell ducks? Just, they just are? I don't know. <laughs> That's what we always call them, shell yeah. ducks. Uh, if somebody been growing up, somebody said, uh, you saw some McGanders, I wouldn't even what they were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and a uh, golden eye was a bullhead. Huh. And a Virginia rail? Marsh in. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, old squall was size settlers. 
South Settlers? South Settlers, I don't know what that, I don't know where oh, that come from. I haven't heard that one. Hmm. We never called them old squall. And now I think they call them long tail ducks. Yeah, long tail ducks. Keep changing the name on you. And curlews, it was curlew then, but now they're wimbrels. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, uh, black breast plover, we always called them hollerhead. Hollerhead. <laughs> oh, it was all my whole entire life called them hollerheads. But they went, most of the time they went, but a sign that it signed, like when he hollered, when he was, makes a sign, mm -hmm. They said he sang like he was hollering, saying "Hollerhead." <laughs> That's where I guess he got his name. The green hern was called Skypes. Okay, that makes sense. And, uh, the white, the white egress was uh, Squaggins. Squaggins, <laughs> Squaggins. I like saying Squaggins. that. Squaggins. I don't know where the name go from. <laughs> and the black crane her uh, herons, they were a wops. Wops. I heard, yeah, heard that. Um. Yeah. <laughs> And what's a mudsucker? He's a little, just a little shore bird. Yeah. And did you call widgeons anything? Ball crane. Ball crane? Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to think what other ones. They had name ball pate, ball crane, widgeon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I heard over in, in Crisfield they called them ball pates too. So. Pin, pin tails, we always we all went by sprig tail. Sprig tail, yep. Did you call. Blue herons, anything? Cranky. Cranky. Yeah. <laughs> cranky. <laughs> yeah, cranky. Uh, the red knot, we called them uh, uh, robin stink. Mm hmm. Robin stink, yep. What about oyster catchers? Is that, is that just oyster uh, catchers? Sea crows. Sea crows. And uh, dowel witchers, uh, gray back. They were called gray back. Oh, okay. Uh. Uh, you, let's see, uh, coot, uh, we, we call them chicken ducks. <laughs> chicken ducks, and, I like that. <laughs> and then we called we called a surf scooter, uh -huh. we called them coots. Oh, well that's confusing. <laughs> we called them coots, but the real coot we called chicken ducks.